Mr. John, Mr. Scow, and to all of the members of the Nobel Committee, ladies and gentlemen. It is impossible to begin this lecture without again expressing my deep appreciation to the Nobel Committee of the Norwegian Parliament for bestowing upon me and the civil rights movement in the United States such a great honor. Occasionally in life, there are those moments of unutterable fulfillment which cannot completely be explained by those symbols called words. Their meaning can only be articulated by the inaudible language of the heart, such as the moment I am presently experiencing. I experience this high and joyous moment not for myself alone, but for those devotees of nonviolence who have moved so courageously against the ramparts of racial injustice and who in the process have acquired a new estimate of their own human worth. Many of them are young and cultured. Others are middle-aged and middle-class. The majority are poor and untutored. But they are all united in the quiet conviction that it is better to suffer in dignity than accept segregation in humiliation. They are the real heroes of the freedom struggle. They are the noble people for whom I'd accept the Nobel Peace Prize. I would like to say also that it is a happy experience to know that so many friends who have worked closely with me over the last few years in this struggle were willing to go into their pocketbooks and their means and their humble financial situations to come to Oslo to be a part of this experience. And naturally it is a great pleasure and privilege to have my devoted wife, my mother and father, my sister and brother, and among the many other friends, my close associate, the one who has been the dearest friend to me in this struggle, Ralph David Abernathy. I would also like to say just a word about the many courtesies extended by the Norwegian people. I have traveled in many lands and many places over the world, but very seldom, if ever, have I found people more friendly than the people of Norway, and we will long remember all of the courtesies extended and your great friendliness. And I particularly want to thank the committee, especially Mr. John, for the eloquent words that he uttered yesterday at the ceremony and yesterday evening at the banquet. And I can assure you that all of these expressions of support are of inestimable value for the continuance of my humble efforts to make brotherhood, 
freedom and justice realities in the United States of America. This evening I would like to use this lofty and historic platform to discuss what appears to me to be the most pressing problem confronting mankind today. Modern man has brought the whole world to an awe-inspiring threshold of the future. He has reached new and astonishing peaks of scientific success. He has produced machines that think, and instruments that peer into the unfathomable ranges of interstellar space. He has built gigantic bridges to span the seas, and gargantuan buildings to kiss the skies. His airplanes and spaceships have dwarfed distance and placed time in chains and carved the highways through the stratosphere. And this is a dazzling picture of modern man's scientific and technological progress. Yet in spite of these spectacular strides in science and technology, and still unlimited ones to come, something basic is missing. And that is a sort of poverty of the spirit, which stands in glaring contrast to our scientific and technological abundance. The richer we have become materially, the poorer we have become morally and spiritually. We have learned to fly the air like birds and swim the sea like fish. But we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers. Every man lives in two realms, the internal and the external. The internal is that realm of spiritual ends expressed in art, literature, morals, and religion. The external is that complex of devices, techniques, mechanisms, and instrumentalities by means of which we live. Our problem today is that we have allowed the internal to become lost in the external. We have allowed the means by which we live to outdistance the ends for which we live. And so much of modern life can be summarized in that arresting dictum of the poet Thoreau, improved means to an unimproved end. This is a serious predicament, the deep and haunting problem confronting modern man. If we are to survive today, our moral and spiritual lag must be eliminated. Enlarged material power spelled enlarged peril. If that is not proportionate growth of the soul, when the without of man's nature subjugates the within, dark storm clouds begin to form in the world. And the problem of spiritual and moral lag, which constitutes modern man's chief dilemma, expresses itself in three larger problems which grow out of man's ethical infantilism. Each of these problems, while appearing to be separate and isolated, is inextricably bound to the other. I refer to racial injustice, poverty, and war. The first problem that I would like to mention is racial injustice. The struggle to eliminate the evil of racial injustice constitutes one of the major struggles of our time. The present upsurge of the Negro people of the United States 
grows out of a deep and passionate determination to make freedom and equality a reality here and now. In one sense, the civil rights movement in the United States is a special American phenomenon which must be understood in the light of American history and dealt with in terms of the American situation. But on another and more important level, what is happening in the United States today is a relatively small part of a world development. We live in a day, says the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, when civilization is shifting its basic outlook, a major turning point in history, where the presuppositions on which society is structured are being analyzed, sharply challenged, and profoundly changed. What we are seeing now is a freedom explosion, the realization of an idea whose time has come, to use Victor Hugo's phrase. The deep rumbling of discontent that we hear today is the thunder of disinherited masses rising from dungeons of oppression to the bright hills of freedom. In one majestic chorus, the rising masses are singing in the words of our freedom song, ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. All over the world like a fever, the freedom movement is spreading in the widest liberation in history. The great masses of people are determined to end the exploitation of their races and their lands. They are awake and moving toward their goal like a tidal wave. You can hear them rumbling in every village street, on the docks and the houses, among the students and the churches, and at political meetings. Historic movement was for several centuries that of the nations and societies of Western Europe out into the rest of the world in conquests of various sorts. That period, the era of colonialism, is at an end. East is meeting West. The earth is being redistributed. Yes, we are shifting our basic outlooks. Now, these developments should not surprise any student of history. Oppressed people cannot remain, remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself. The Bible tells a thrilling story of how Moses stood in Pharaoh's court centuries ago and cried, let my people go. This is a kind of opening chapter in a continuing story. The present struggle in the United States is a later chapter in the same unfolding story. Something within has reminded the Negro of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it can be gained, consciously or unconsciously. He has been caught up by the zeitgeist and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers in Asia, South America, and the Caribbean. The United States Negro is moving with a sense of great urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. Fortunately, some significant strides have been made in the struggle to end the long night of racial injustice. We have seen the magnificent drama of independence unfold in Asia and Africa. Just 30 years ago, there were only three independent nations in the whole of Africa. But today, 35 African nations have risen from colonial bondage. In the United States, we have witnessed the gradual demise of the system of racial segregation. The Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlawing segregation in the public schools, gave a legal and constitutional death blow 
to the whole doctrine of separate but equal. The court decreed that separate facilities are inherently unequal and that to segregate a child on the basis of his race is to deny that child equal protection of the law. This decision came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of disinherited people. Then came that glowing day a few months ago when a strong civil rights bill became the law of the land. This bill, which was first recommended and promoted by President Kennedy, was passed because of the overwhelming support and perseverance from millions of Americans, Negro and white. It came as a bright interlude in the long and sometimes turbulent struggle for civil rights, the beginning of a second Emancipation Proclamation, providing a comprehensive legal basis for the equality of opportunity. Since the passage of this bill, we have seen some encouraging and surprising signs of compliance. I'm happy to report that, by and large, communities all over the southern part of the United States are obeying the civil rights law and showing remarkable good sense in the process. Another indication that progress is being made was found in the recent presidential election in the United States. The American people reveal great maturity by overwhelmingly rejecting a presidential candidate who had become identified with extremism, racism, and retrogression. The voters of our nation rendered a telling blow to the radical right. They defeated those elements in our society which seek to pit white against Negro and lead the nation down a dangerous fascist path. Now let me not leave you with a false impression. The problem is far from solved. We still have a long, long way to go before the dream of freedom is a reality for the Negro in the United States. To put it figuratively in biblical language, we have left the dusty soils of Egypt and crossed a Red Sea whose waters had for years been hardened by a long and piercing winter of massive resistance. But before we reach the majestic shores of the Promised Land, that is a frustrating and bewildering wilderness ahead. <laughs> we must still face prodigious hilltops of opposition and gigantic mountains of resistance. But with patient and firm determination, we will press on until every valley of despair is exalted to new peaks of hope, until every mountain of pride and irrationality is made low by the leavening process of humility and compassion, until the rough places of injustice are transformed into a smooth plain of equality and opportunity, and until the crooked places of prejudice are transformed by the straightening process of bright-eyed wisdom. What the main sections of the civil rights movement in the United States are saying is that the demand for dignity, equality, jobs, and citizenship will not be abandoned or diluted or postponed. If that means resistance and conflict, we shall not flinch. We shall not be cowed. We are no longer afraid. The word that symbolizes the spirit and the outward form of our encounter is nonviolence. And it is doubtless that factor which made it seem appropriate to award a peace prize to one identified with struggle. Broadly speaking, nonviolence in the civil rights struggle has meant not relying on arms and weapons for struggle. It has meant non-cooperation with customs and laws 
which are institutional aspects of a regime of discrimination and ensla enslavement. It has meant direct participation of masses in protest rather than reliance on indirect methods, which frequently do not involve masses in action at all. Nonviolence has also meant that my people in the agonizing struggles of recent years have taken suffering upon themselves instead of inflicting it on others. It has meant, as I said, that we are no longer afraid and cowed, but in some substantial degree, it has meant that we do not want to instill fear in others or into the society of which we are a part. The movement does not seek to liberate Negroes at the expense of the humiliation and enslavement of whites. It seeks no victory over anyone. It seeks to liberate American society and to share in the self-liberation of all the people. Violence as a way of achieving racial justice is, I am convinced, both impractical and immoral. I am not unmindful of the fact that violence often brings about momentary results. Nations have frequently won their independence in battle. But in spite of temporary victories, violence never brings permanent peace. It solves no social problems. It merely creates new and more complicated ones. Violence is impractical, impractical because it is a descending spiral, ending in destruction for all. It is immoral because it seeks to humiliate the opponent rather than win his understanding. It seeks to annihilate rather than convert. Violence is immoral because it thrives on hatred rather than love. It destroys community and makes brotherhood impossible. It leaves society in monologue rather than dialogue. Violence ends up defeating itself. It creates bitterness in the survivors and brutality in the destroyers. In a real sense, nonviolence seeks to redeem the spiritual and moral lag that I spoke of earlier as the chief dilemma of modern man. It seeks to secure moral ends through moral means. Nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon. Indeed, it is a weapon unique in history which cuts without wounding and ennobles a man who wills it. I believe in this method because I think it is the only way to reestablish a broken community. It is a method which seeks to implement the just law by appealing to the conscience of the great decent majority who through blindness, fear, pride, and irrationality have allowed their consciences to sleep. The nonviolent resistors can summarize our message in the following simple terms. We will take direct action against injustice. Despite the failure of governmental and other official agencies to act first, we will not obey unjust laws or submit to unjust practices. We will do this peacefully, openly, cheerfully, because our aim is to persuade. We adopt the means of nonviolence because our end is a community at peace with itself. We will try to persuade with our words. But if our words fail, we will try to persuade with our acts. We will always be willing to talk and seek fair compromise but we are ready to suffer when necessary and even risk our lives in order to become witnesses to truth as we see it. This approach to the problem is not at all without successful precedent. It was used in a magnificent way by Mohandas K. Gandhi 
to challenge the might of the British Empire and free his people from the political domination and economic exploitation inflicted upon them for centuries. He struggled only with the weapons of truth, soul force, non-injury and courage. In the past ten years, unarmed gallant men and women of the United States have given living testimony to the moral power and efficacy of nonviolence. By the thousands, faceless, anonymous, relentless young people, black and white, have temporary, temporarily left the ivory towers of learning to storm the barricades of bias. And their courageous and disciplined activities have come as a refreshing oasis in a desert sweltering with the heat of injustice. They have taken our whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. One day all of America will be proud of that achievement. I'm only too well aware of the human weaknesses and failures which exist, the doubts about the efficacy of nonviolence and the open advocacy of violence by some, but I am still convinced that nonviolence is both the most practically sound and morally excellent way to grapple with the age-old problem of racial injustice. A second evil which plagues the modern world is that of poverty. Like a monstrous octopus, it projects its nagging prehensile tentacles in lands and villages all over the world. Almost two-thirds of the peoples of the world go to bed hungry at night. They are undernourished, ill-housed, and shabbily clad. Many of them have no houses or beds to sleep in. Their only beds are the sidewalks of the cities and the dusty roads of the villages. Most of these poverty-stricken children of God have never seen a physician or a dentist. This problem of poverty is not only seen in the class division between the highly in developed industrial nations and the so-called underdeveloped nations. It is seen in the great economic gaps within the rich nations themselves. Take my own country, for example. We have developed the greatest system of production that history has ever known. We have become the richest nation in the world. Our national gross product this year will reach the astounding figure of almost $650 billion. Yet at least one-fifth of our fellow citizens, some 10 million families, comprising about 40 million individuals, are bound to a miserable culture of poverty. In a sense, the poverty of the poor in America is more frustrating than the poverty of Africa and Asia. The misery of the poor in Africa and Asia is shared misery, a fact of life for the vast majority. They are all poor together as a result of years of exploitation and underdevelopment. In sad contrast, the poor in America know that they live in the richest nation in the world, and that even though they are perishing on a lonely island of poverty, they are surrounded by the vast ocean of material prosperity. Glistening towers of glass and steel, easily seen from their slum dwellings, spring up almost overnight. Jetliners speed over their ghettos, at 600 miles an hour, satellites streak throughout a space and reveal details of the moon. 
President Johnson, in his State of the Union message, emphasized this contradiction, and he heralded the United States' highest standard of living in the world and deplored that it was accompanied by dislocation, loss of jobs, and the specter of poverty in the midst of plenty. So it is obvious that if man is to redeem his spiritual and moral lag, he must go all out to bridge the social and economic gulf between the haves and the have-nots of the world. Poverty is one of the most urgent items on the agenda of modern life. That is nothing new about poverty. What is new, however, is that we have the resources to get rid of it. More than a century and a half ago, people began to be disturbed about the twin problems of population and production. A thoughtful Englishman named Malthus wrote a book that set forth some rather frightening conclusions. He predicted that the human family was gradually moving toward global starvation because the world was producing people faster than it was producing food and material to support them. Later scientists, however, disproved the conclusions of Malthus and revealed that he had vastly underestimated the resources of the world and the resourcefulness of man. Not too many years ago, Dr. Kirtley Mather, a Harvard geologist, wrote a book entitled Enough and to Spare. He set forth the basic theme that famine is wholly unnecessary in the modern world. Today, therefore, the question on the agenda must read, why should there be hunger and privation in any land, in any city, at any table, when man has the resources and the scientific know-how to provide all mankind with the basic necessities of life. Even deserts can be irrigated and topsoil can be replaced. We cannot complain of a lack of land, for there are 25 million square miles of tillable land, of which we are using less than 7 million. We have amazing knowledge of vitamins, nutrition, the chemistry of food, and the versatility of atoms. That is no deficit in human resources. The deficit is in human will. The well-off and the secure have too often become indifferent and oblivious to the poverty and deprivation in their midst. The poor in our countries have been shut out of our minds and driven from the mainstream of our societies because we have allowed them to become invisible. Just as nonviolence exposed the ugliness of racial injustice, so must the infection and sickness of poverty be exposed and healed, not only its symptoms but its basic causes. This too will be a fierce struggle but we must not be afraid to pursue the remedy, no matter how formidable the task. The time has come for an all-out war against poverty. The rich nations must use their vast resources of wealth to develop the undeveloped, school the unschooled, and feed the unfed. Ultimately, a great nation is a compassionate nation. No individual or nation can be great if it does not have a concern for the least of these. Deeply etched in the fiber of our religious tradition is the conviction that men are made in the image of God and that they are souls of infinite metaphysical value, the heirs of a legacy of dignity and worth. If we feel this as a profound moral fact, we cannot be content to see men hungry, to see men victimized with starvation and ill health when we have the means to help them. The wealthy nations must go all out 
to bridge the gulf between the rich minority and the poor majority. In the final analysis, the rich must not ignore the poor because both rich and poor are tied together in a single garment of destiny. All life is interrelated, and all men are interdependent. The agony of the poor diminishes the rich, and the salvation of the poor enlarges the rich. We are inevitably our brother's keeper because of the interrelated structure of reality. John Donne interpreted this truth in graphic terms when he affirmed no man is an island in tide of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is a less as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a minority of thy friends or thine own self were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. A third great evil confronting our world is that of war. Recent events have vis vividly reminded us that nations are not reducing, but rather increasing their arsenals of weapons of mass destruction. The best brains in the highly developed nations of the world are devoted to military technology. The proliferation of nuclear weapons has not been halted in spite of the limited test ban treaty. On the contrary, the detonation of an atomic device by the first non-white, non-Western and so-called underdeveloped power namely the Chinese People's Republic, opens new vistas of exposure of vast multitudes, a whole of humanity, to insidious terrorization by the ever-present threat of annihilation. The fact that most of the time human beings put the truth about the nature and risk of the nuclear war out of their minds because it is too painful and therefore not acceptable does not alter the nature and risk of such a war. The device of rejection may temporarily cover up anxiety, but it does not bestow peace of mind and emotional security. So man's proneness to engage in war is still a fact. But wisdom born of experience should tell us that war is obsolete there may have been a time when war served as a negative good by preventing the spread and growth of an evil force. But the destructive power of modern weapons eliminates even the possibility that war may serve as a negative good. If we assume that life is worth living and that man has a right to survive, then we must find an alternative to war. In a day when vehicles hurtle throughout a space and guided ballistic missiles carve highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can claim victory in war. A so-called limited war will leave little more than a calamitous legacy of human suffering, political turmoil and political disillusionment. A world war, God forbid, will leave only smoldering ashes as a mute testimony of a human race whose folly led inexorably to ultimate death. And so if modern man's con man continues to flirt unhesitatingly with war, he will transform his earthly habitat into an inferno such as even the mind of Dante could not imagine. Therefore, I venture to suggest to all of you and all who hear and may eventually read these words that the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence become immediately a subject for study and for serious experimentation in every field of human conflict 
by no means excluding the relations between nations. It is, after all, nation states which made war, which have produced the weapons which threaten the survival of mankind, and which are both genocidal and suicidal in character. Here also we have ancient habits to deal with, vast structures of power, indescribably complicated problems to solve. But unless we abdicate our humanity altogether, and succumb to fear and importance in the presence of the weapons we have ourselves created. It is imperative and urgent to put an end to war and violence between nations, as it is to put an end to racial injustice. Equality with whites will hardly solve the problems of either whites or Negroes if it means equality in a society under the spell of terror and a world doomed to extinction. I do not wish to minim minimize the complexities of the problems that need to be faced in achieving disarmament and peace. But I think it is a fact that we shall not have the will, the courage, and the insight to deal with such matters unless in this field we are prepared to undergo a mental and spiritual re-evaluation, a change of focus, which will enable us to see that the things which seem most real and powerful are indeed now unreal and have come under the sentence of death. We need to make a supreme effort to generate the readiness, indeed the eagerness, to enter into the new world which is now possible the city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We will not build a peaceful world by following a negative path. It is not enough to say we must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and sacrifice for it. We must concentrate not merely on the negative expulsion of war, but on the positive affirmation of peace. And that is a fascinating little story that is preserved for us in Greek literature about Ulysses and the sirens. The sirens had the ability to sing so sweetly that sailors could not resist staring toward their island. Many ships were lured upon the rocks, and men forgot home, duty, and honor as they flung themselves into the sea to become embraced by arms that drew them down to death. Ulysses, determined not to be lured by the sirens, first decided to tie himself tightly to the mast of his boat, and his, and his crew stuffed their ears with wax. But finally he and his crew learned a better way to save themselves. They took on board the beautiful singer Orpheus, whose melodies were sweeter than the music of the sirens. When Orpheus sang, who bothered to listen to the sirens? And so we must fix our visions not merely on the negative expulsion of war, but upon the positive affirmation of peace. We must see that peace represents a sweeter music, a cosmic melody that is far superior to the discords of war. Somehow we must transform the dynamics of the world power struggle from the negative nuclear arms race which no one can win to a positive contest to harness man's creative genius for the purpose of making peace and prosperity a re reality for all of the nations of the world. In short, we must shift the arms race into a peace race. If we have the will and determination to mount such a peace offensive, we will unlock hitherto, hitherto tightly sealed doors of hope and transform our imminent cosmic elegy into a psalm of creative fulfillment. All that I have said 
boils down to the point of affirming that mankind's survival is dependent upon man's ability to solve the problems of racial injustice, poverty, and war. The solution of these problems is in turn dependent upon man squaring his moral progress with his scientific progress and learning the practical art of living in harmony. Some years ago, a novelist died. Among his papers was found a list of suggested story plots for further stories, the most prominently underscored being this one. A widely separated family inherits a house in which they have to live together. This is a great new problem of mankind. We have inherited a big house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, black men and white men, Easterners and Westerners, Gentiles and Jews, Catholics and Protestants, Muslims and Hindus, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interests, who, because we can never again live without each other, must learn somehow in this one big world house to live with each other. And this is our great challenge. This means that more and more our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. We must now give an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in our individual societies. This call for the worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all men. This oft misunderstood and misinterpreted concept so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response, which is little more than emotional bosh. I'm speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let us hope that this spirit will become the order of the day. As Arnold Toynbee says, love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word. We can no longer afford to worship the God of hate, or bow before the altars of retaliation. The oceans of history are made turbulent by the ever-rising tides of hate, and history is cluttered with the wreckage of nations and individuals that pursued this self-defeating path of hate. Love is a key to the solution of the problem of the world. Let me close by saying 
that I have the personal faith that mankind will somehow rise up to the occasion and give new directions to an age drifting rapidly toward its doom. In spite of the tensions and uncertainties of this period, something profoundly meaningful is taking place. Old systems of exploitation and oppression are passing away, and out of the wounds of, the frail, of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. Doors of opportunity are gradually being opened to those at the bottom of society, the shirtless and barefoot people of the land are developing a new sense of somebodiness and carving a tunnel of hope through the dark mounting of despair. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Here and there an individual or group dares to love and rises to the majestic heights of moral maturity. And so in a real sense, this is a great time to be alive. Therefore, I am not yet discouraged about the future. Granted that the easygoing optimism of yesterday is impossible. Granted that those who pioneered in the struggle for peace and freedom will still face uncomfortable jail sales, painful threats of death. And they will still be battered by the storms of persecution, leading them to the nagging feeling at times that they can no longer bear such a heavy burden, the temptation of wanting to retreat to a more quiet and serene life. Granted that we face a world crisis which leaves us standing so often amid the surging murmur of life's restless sea, but every crisis has both its dangers and its opportunities. It can spell either salvation or doom in a dark, confused world. The kingdom of God may yet reign in the hearts of men, and we will come to that great and glad day when men all over the world will be able to join hands, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, Hindus and Muslims, and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you.